All right, so we've seen how to calculate the velocity function of an object if we know its position by taking the derivative. But what about the inverse question? Suppose I'm driving my car and I'm driving at 50 kilometers per hour, then I accelerate, decelerate, and so on, and I want to calculate the distance I'm going to cover in the next two hours. Right, so that's the inverse question. Instead of starting with position and going to velocity, now I want to start with velocity and calculate the position. How can I do that? Well, let's investigate. So what we'll do is first study a very simple case, and then to try to generalize it for arbitrary velocity functions. So suppose first that I'm driving on cruise control, so my velocity is constant, say 50 kilometers per hour. So mathematically, I could sketch the graph of my velocity function, and I'll just get a horizontal line. Now if I ask you to calculate the distance I'm going to cover, say, between one hour and five hours, then I'm pretty sure you know how to do it. So the distance here between one hour and five hours will just be given by the product of the velocity times what I'll call delta t, which is just the full time interval here, so 5 minus 1 equals to 4. Now the reason is that simple is that my velocity is constant, so it's the same over the whole time interval. There's something quite interesting to notice here, is that this product has a nice geometric interpretation. If I draw vertical lines here over the endpoints of my time interval, then you notice that the length of the horizontal edge of my rectangle here is just the time interval, while the length of the vertical edge is just a constant velocity. So this product here is really calculating the area under the graph of my velocity, velocity function. So in other words, the distance covered over this time interval is the same as the area under the graph of the velocity function. This connection is extremely important, just as was the connection between derivatives and tangent lines, so we'll study that in more detail in the next few videos. Okay, let's now look at a more complicated case. So suppose I'm driving my car, but I'm not on cruise control anymore. I pass someone, so I accelerate, then I decelerate, and so on. So my velocity function is not a horizontal line anymore. It's going to be something, whatever it is, is not so important, but it's clearly not a line anymore. But I still want to calculate the same thing, namely the distance covered between one hour and five hours. How can I do that? Well, this is not so easy. I cannot use such a formula here because the velocity is not constant. What I can do is be clever and say I don't know how to calculate it for the full time interval, but I can do it step by step. So I'll just start by calculating the distance I'm covering over the first minute, then do it over the second minute, and so on, up until I reach the full time interval. All right, so that makes sense. So let's start with the first minute. So what distance am I covering over the first minute? I'm going to call that d1. Well, over one minute, I can, you know, approximate my velocity to be pretty much constant over one minute. So I'll call it v1. And then all I have to do is multiply by the time interval, which I take to be one minute here. And that gives me a pretty good approximation distance I'm covering over the first minute. Now, of course, I can do the same thing over the second minute. I'll get something which I'll call d2, which is, again, the same thing. But here, v2, which is the approximation of my velocity over the second minute, so it's just constant here, may be slightly different from the velocity over the first minute. But I take it to be pretty much constant over the one minute interval. And I can keep going like that up until I reach the end point of my time interval. And I get a pretty good approximation to the distance. Right? I'm going to use quote here because it's just an approximation. But what I'll do is just add up the little distance I'm covering over each minute. And then the sum of all of those will give me a pretty good approximation of the distance I'm covering over the full time interval. Right. OK, so what's going on geometrically? Well, what I'm doing here is the following. So let's say that this is a one minute time interval. So I'm going to draw some vertical line here. So I'm approximating my velocity function here as just being a small horizontal line. And then this product here, which I call d1, calculates the area of that little rectangle here. So that's over the first minute. Now over the second minute, I'm doing something very similar. Approximating my velocity function by a horizontal line and calculating the area of the little rectangle. And I keep going until I reach the end point. So this is my last minute interval. So my velocity function is again approximated by a horizontal line, and I'm calculating this area. And what I'm doing here is adding up the areas of all of these small rectangles. And that gives me a pretty good approximation of the area under the curve over this full time interval. 
So this is the same statement as saying that I have a good approximation for the distance that I'm covering. Okay, that's great, but this is just an approximation, right? It's not, it's not precise, because over each time interval here, each minute, my velocity is not really constant. This is just an approximation. So I can, how can I use this process to actually calculate precisely the distance or the area under the graph? Well, what I can do is be very clever and a little crazy. So one thing you notice is that if you uh, take these time intervals to be smaller, so say that instead of choosing one minute interval, we had chosen one second interval, then of course we would get many, many more intervals here, so many more little rectangles. Each of those would have much smaller width, but the approximation would be much better. The approximation to the distance or to the area under the graph would be a lot better because over one second interval, if I approximate the velocity as being constant over each second interval, I get a much better approximation of the velocity function than if I do it over one minute interval. Right, so the smaller the time interval, the better the approximation is. Now this is where the crazy comes in. So what you could say is then, well, I can take my time interval to be just as small as possible, so extremely, extremely small. So mathematically, we would call that infinitesimal, meaning that they have pretty much zero size. Now, if you do that, then you'll basically have a whole lot of little rectangles here. In fact, you'll get an infinite amount of rectangles. So what you're doing is doing a limit process where you're adding up, instead of adding up a finite number of little distances to get a good approximation, now you add an infinite number of distances, each of which is over an infinitesimal amount of time, meaning like extremely small. Now this sounds all crazy, but you can make all of this very rigorous mathematically, and what you'll get is a precise calculation, extremely a perfectly precise calculation of the distance covered or the area under the curve. This limit process is totally well defined, is very rigorous, and it's called taking the integral of the velocity function here. And the area of mathematics that study these things is integral calculus, not surprisingly. So we'll uh, define that rigorously in the next few videos, and we'll spend many weeks uh, this semester and next semester studying integrals and integral calculus in general.